Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John Rose. I'm Dean for Diversity and Compliance here at Hunter College. And uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce uh, this evening's program. On behalf of Hunter College and on behalf of uh, President Jennifer J. Rabb, I would like to extend greetings and a warm welcome to our distinguished panelists, to our guests here in the Roosevelt House Auditorium, and to uh, the many people who are listening online. This will be a uh, very timely and stimulating conversation, um, and we can have no better place for it than this historic site, uh, the home of uh, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt between 1908 and 1933. It was here that uh, Franklin launched his successful campaigns, first for governor of New York and then for president of the United States. It was here that the uh, presidential transition team met to map out the strategies for what would become the New Deal. And it was here that initiatives, bold initiatives, were hatched to address the systemic problems of that day. Uh, Roosevelt House has uh, undergone a significant uh, renovation uh, under President Rabb and now serves as a thriving public policy institute. One of the most serious problems uh, facing our country is the tragic failure of our public schools to educate our most vulnerable populations, black and Latino children, and in particular, black and Latino young men. A very quick look at the numbers tells the story. According to the Schott Foundation report, in 2012, national graduation rates for non-Hispanic white males was 78%. For, for black males, it was 52%. And for Hispanic males, it was 58%. In New York, the non-Hispanic white male graduation rate was identical to the national rate at 78%, but the black male graduation rate was just 37%, as was the Hispanic male graduation rate, well below the disappointingly low national average. And to make matters worse, the college readiness rate in New York for black males was just 10%. W.B. Du Bois famously used the phrase talented 10th to identify blacks who at the height of de jure Jim Crow segregation could emerge as leaders. Though Du Bois referred to it as a floor, today's public education system seems to impose a ceiling on blacks who could emerge ready for college and ready to become leaders in the 21st century. Given demographic trends predicting that minorities will become the majority population by mid-century, the lack of college readiness for such a large percentage of our future workforce puts at risk the knowledge capital our country needs to fuel innovation, global marketplace competitiveness, and economic growth. We know from experience that students who finish high school despite their environment, not because of it, have considerable untapped potential, but we need to provide a variety of assistance to them in order to achieve it. At the City University of New York, a program known as the Black Male Initiative was launched, or BMI, was launched in 2004. While open to all students, BMI is tailored to address the needs of black and Latino young men. At Hunter, the BMI program is known as Brothers for Excellence. Our goal is to overcome some of the cultural detritus and self-limiting fears that constrain black and Latino young men. Our program offers a new kind of four R's, rigor, relevance, relationships, and readiness. And it's based on the pioneering work of Sean Harper, who studied and identified success factors for college-age black males. We inculcate values of intellectual curiosity, persistence, and perseverance. We set high expectations for course completion, academic achievement, graduation, and preparation for graduate or professional schools. We provide academic, social, cultural, emotional supports, and we tailor it to the needs of each individual student. 
It's not unusual for students like ours to avoid talking about themselves or asking questions. It's a cultural norm that we have to break through. I remember several sessions that I and uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Marsha Cantarella, who's in the audience here somewhere, uh, had with a promising young man who was reluctant to talk about what really interested him. We nurtured him and gave him the confidence to speak up first in our group and then to his faculty. And as a result, he helped his faculty recognize not only his academic interest, but his talents. He was then uh, provided with opportunities to join several of the pipeline programs we have at Hunter and is now uh, on his way to pursuing a PhD in bioengineering. And he's not the only PhD candidate we have from among our recent graduates. Prestigious universities pursuing PhD. Masters or law degrees. In my view, however, given that so few black and Latino males even make it from high school to college, we cannot wait for higher education to provide the making positive outcomes. These efforts must start earlier in the K through 12 environment. We need to provide safe spaces for these kids, places that can engage them intellectually, academically, emotionally, socially. We need to create college-going cultures. We need a place where they can succeed because of their environment, not despite it. And we need to remove that artificial cap that only prevents 10% of these graduating black and Latino males from being college ready so our colleges and future leaders can more accurately reflect the demographics of our country. That's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion. So we are fortunate to have a very distinguished panel moderated by our own Dean David Steiner, the Clara and Larry Silverstein Dean of the Hunter College School of Education and Director of the CUNY Institute of Education Policy. And I'd like to turn the program over to him to introduce the rest of our panelists. Welcome, everybody. It's a particular privilege to be here this evening. I can't think actually of a more serious and critical topic to be discussed. We have with us in the audience many who have devoted their professional lives to this issue, and, and that is particularly moving. Um, we have folks from the absolute front line, the classrooms of today, um, and we have with us uh, Regent Young, who was my boss when I was commissioner uh, in Albany. Um, it's a matter of public record that Regent Young would remind not only me, but his fellow regents and my fellow staff, each and every board meeting uh, to remember and, and not to let go of the immediate thought of these students. Uh, so it's a privilege to see you with us today. Let me do without the usual long CVs. Uh, these are immensely distinguished people, and uh, in the era of Google, um, anyone who's interested may spend several hours uh, reading through the publications and the honors. Um, I've asked each of the speakers uh, to speak for about seven minutes. If they go on more, much more than that, I will remind them they'll have more opportunities later to speak. Um, and we want to begin with Pedro Nogueira, who obviously needs no introduction whatsoever, because uh, I can't think of anyone actually in the United States who is uh, better qualified to give us a sense of the national picture uh, for African-American males. And so let's start with you. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank uh, Hunter uh, for hosting us. And um, it's such a pleasure to be in this lovely home and to hear a little bit about its history. I'm just admiring the court on the wall. Um, if Richard were to move his head, I'd know. I think the last one says uh, uh, the fourth freedom is the freedom from fear. That's right. <clears throat> and um, makes me think that we've been using fear as a strategy for school improvement um, for the last several years. Fear of failure. Fear of having your school shut down. Um, not a great motivator for this population in particular, especially a group that is known failure in uh, many facets of life. So I want to start by posing two questions that I think we need to grapple with. The first question is, why is it that in a city like New York, where the evidence shows 
Progress was made over the last 12 years in terms of graduation rates and other important indicators. Why so little progress for this population in particular? What was wrong? And then secondly, I think an equally important question is, what is the problem that we're trying to fix here? Right. I think there's a tendency very often in this work to confuse symptoms with causes. Right. We know, and we heard already, that <clears throat> African American males in particular, but in many cases Latino males as well, are overrepresented in all the categories we associate with failure in school, from special ed placements to dropout rates, et cetera, and underrepresented in those categories we associate with success. What we don't know is <clears throat> why. What is there about the children or these young men or the schools they're in that contributes to these patterns? How you locate or where you locate the problem will influence how you respond. If you think the problem is the young men, then you're going to try to do things to change them. However, if you think the problem is the schools they're in, you'll go in a different direction. I would say, given the fact that the reforms we pursued have not resulted in the kind of gains we would have hoped to see for this population, we need to look more closely at the schools that they're in and the kinds of reforms we followed. We've done research, and there's a, a flyer hopefully available about um, schools, that, uh, seven schools across the country that have been serving African-American males. The question we've been asking is how they go about trying to promote resilience in these young men. Four of those schools were in New York City. Two of those schools were shut down since we started our study. What we found in those schools is that there was a deliberate effort to try to not just raise achievement, but to address the social and emotional developmental needs of young men. That is a recognition that you couldn't simply focus on academic outcomes without focusing also on what was happening in their lives. Now, I would also add that these schools, as you would see if you read the book, and I encourage you to get the book, often didn't have adequate resources and struggled in their ability to figure out how to address those issues because they were not only addressing issues within school but also issues outside of school, which I would say is part of what's wrong here. That is, we have focused on what schools can do and we've completely ignored what neighborhoods have to do, what cities have to do, what our society must do to address this. And if we think that we can solve this through school reform, we're fooling ourselves, particularly because once you look and recognize that the patterns we see in school mirror patterns we see in society, that is African-American males being overrepresented amongst the unemployed, amongst the incarcerated, right, then you realize that we have a bigger problem on our hands that can't be solved simply through school reform. It's a structural problem. And by structural, what I mean is that our economy has marginalized a segment of our population that once provided manual labor, but whose labor is no longer in high demand. And unless we try to address and develop strategies to address the structural problem, the opportunity gap, I don't believe we're going to do much. And I don't believe that focusing only on schools will take us where we need to go. We need a more comprehensive strategy that situates the problem not just in schools, but in communities, in society. And we need to look at examples where we see progress being made and learn from those, which unfortunately is not what we do with respect to public policy. Did they go on? Uh, that absolutely. was enough? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> you even have a minute of reserve time to be used okay. later. Um, <laughs> Sean, uh, you've been right at the forefront of all of this work and you have been campaigning for some time uh, to raise consciousness about the problem and you've been working to do something about it. Why don't you tell us Great. about your work? 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Really uh, thrilled to be here for this really important and critical conversation. And uh, just as Pedro said, you know, just it's an honor to be in this house. And um, as Dr. Rose set us up, that this is a place where big ideas are launched and new initiatives. And so there are high expectations, uh, not necessarily on the panel, but the folks in the audience, <laughs> right, that um, Whenever I talk about this work, uh, I lead a campaign for black male achievement uh, for the Open Society Foundations. And similar to uh, what Pedro said, and it's got to say, it's always has been my dream to follow Pedro Noguera <laughs> on an education <laughs> panel. And I, so uh, thank you for that. Um, is that, you know, I always say that the Calvary is uh, not coming. Right, and when we look at the conditions of our schools across this country, particularly uh, as it relates to the outcomes for uh, black and Latino boys, uh, there is no cavalry coming to uh, save the day. And from the work that we have done with the campaign for uh, black male achievement, we have begun this with a, a operating principle that there is nothing wrong with black boys in America. Uh, that black boys in America are assets and that it is not them that need to be fixed. It is indeed the systems, uh, the structures uh, of the schools. And so what we have seen over the last uh, uh, six years that we have um, operated the campaign for black male achievement, particularly in the philanthropic sector, uh, this is an area where there was scant resources, scant conversations, uh, that you could not find two conferences like this in the same week around this, uh, around this issue. But we have, uh, seen a groundswell of activity, initiatives, and one of the things that we have to be really mindful of when we look at the educational outcomes and all that we're seeing is that we can't confuse the activity uh, with progress, right? That uh, it is great to have these uh, conversations, it's great to launch initiatives. And so we are partnered with um, the uh, New York City Department of Ed. We launched uh, in partnership with them the Expanded uh, Success Initiative. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg launched uh, the Young Men's Initiative and approached the Open Society Foundation to be a partner, and specifically around uh, ESI. And part of the campaign's goal was to invest uh, in education, invest in uh, preparing young men to, uh, to succeed academically, to get ready for college. And one of the things that really struck us about this opportunity to partner with uh, New York City in the Expanded Success Initiative was that they shifted the narrative and the focus um, a great degree. Uh, the country had been talking about uh, up until this point, for the most part, the graduation rates of black and Latino uh, boys. And ESI and its focus decided that it was going to shine a light not on graduation rates, but are boys graduating, black and Latino boys graduating college and career ready. And we looked at the data, and the data was showing that in New York City, uh, the graduation rate was hovering around 50%, but what we were seeing was that boys, uh, black and Latino boys, are graduating college ready at 18%. And so what does that mean? That means uh, when you graduate and you, if you did go to college, you had to take remediation uh, and remedial classes. And persistence immediately was hampered there. So it, it shifted the, uh, the, the conversation. And then also, what it did also, when I look around the country and the work that I do, there's a lot of exciting work that's happening. This work happening here uh, with Eagle Academy, uh, Urban Prep in Chicago, uh, Oakland Unified School District has launched the first ever district-wide department for uh, African-American male achievement. But the challenge that we're facing right now is how do we move from these pockets of uh, impact and promise and these little uh, uh, small uh, uh, advances to system change? And that's what we're looking at here in New York City. I would venture to say that we uh, launched this in an, an administration too late, right? You know, there were three terms. We should have did it the second term. Uh, as, you know, the challenge that we're facing with ESI, and we started with a cohort of ninth graders, they're just completing their uh, sophomore year. 
and we're faced with the political uh, 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 challenges around that. I am thrilled to say that there is a great deal of um, renewed or new interest in the philanthropic sector around this issue. Uh, last year at the Council of Foundations, uh, 26 foundation presidents came together and they said that they wanted to make increased investments and more engagement around this issue. We all know that President Obama last month launched My Brother's Keepers uh, a campaign. I would venture to say with all that activity, we have to lean in on this issue, particularly on education, even harder. Uh, because some folks will say, my brother's keeper, the executive alliance of, uh, uh, of, of executives for philanthropic um, uh, uh, improving outcomes for black men and boys, oh, we have this problem solved. Uh, and we are just uh, scratching the surface. The, the other thing I will say about the uh, partnership with ESI, and Pedro touched on this uh, also, that um, the improved outcomes are not going to happen uh, in a vacuum. It includes a whole community approach. It includes parent organizing. It includes partnering with community-based organizations to come into the school, have relationships, and that was part of an, part of the ESI expanded success uh, initiative. And uh, I, I'm going to stop there, and uh, hopefully we'll get around two. Will there be seconds? Yeah. Okay. All even, right. Even thirds. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to actually have a presentation with PowerPoint. Um, Adriana, who is working on actually analyzing this project that we've been speaking of. Yes. So I'm, I'm unfortunately not as naturally eloquent as Pedro and Sean, so I need slides. And um, I'm going to ask for a, a grace period because this presentation is about nine minutes. Uh, so I want to spend a few minutes today talking about some of our findings from the year one implementation study of the Expanded Success Initiative. Um, as the external evaluators of ESI, the Research Alliance is conducting a mixed method four-year study that spans the length of the initiative. And our evaluation really has two primary goals. The first is to ultimately assess whether or to, to what degree ESI is impacting schools and students. But we're also interested in surfacing some of the best practices that schools and even districts can implement to more effectively serve young men of color. And at this point, it's a little too early to talk about impacts. As Sean mentioned, ESI is in year two currently. Um, but I think some of our implementation findings really do start to highlight some of the successful strategies that ESI educators are implementing in their schools. The evaluation also builds off of at least part of ESI's theory of action, which is that it takes an integration of these three different areas or domains that you see here. Uh, and the, again, the theory of action is based on research that suggests that increasing academic rigor, providing ample opportunities for youth development, and creating a school culture that is geared towards college and career will increase college readiness for black and Latino men. Um, because of this uh, orientation, we've decided to structure some of our findings to highlight changes in each of the three areas. The implementation study this year is largely focused on interview data in 38 of the 40 schools. Um, two of the schools are not included in our, our analysis, to just say, um, because they were severely affected by Hurricane Sandy at the time of our data collection. But in the remaining 38 schools, we interviewed principals, we interviewed ESI design team leader. These were individuals who were instrumental in the planning and development of ESI in their schools. We also interviewed focus groups. We did con focus groups with th uh, three ninth grade teachers in every school because, again, ESI was focused on ninth grade in year one. What we learned from talking to these educators was that uh, schools really did report changes in response to those three domain areas, the academics, youth development, and school culture. They also reported changes in the area of culturally relevant education, which was not one of the three domains, but really a cross-cutting um, underlying principle that has been informing the entire initiative. And finally, something that emerged from um, talking to educators, administrators, and teachers was that program cohesion or coherence was a really important factor for effectively implementing ESI. 
Within academics, uh, schools reported uh, changing, increasing opportunities for students to take more rigorous coursework, including AP classes and honors classes, uh, changing student programming so that students could take at least four years of math and science, and finally, in some cases, in a few cases, raising academic benchmarks or standards in, st in certain courses, especially in math courses like Algebra One and Algebra Two. Youth development uh, teachers and principals talked about that a little bit differently. They focused less on the specific strategies around youth development and more on improved relationships in their schools, um, which they saw as an important byproduct of their youth development programming. So more than half of the ESI schools that we visited reported improvement in, t in relationships between teachers and students. Uh, especially in cases where teachers were becoming more adept or more in tune with serving students' social emotional needs outside of their regular classroom needs. Um, in addition, they also reported changes or improvements in relationships between students, in particular because a lot of the schools were implementing these single-sex advisory classes. Uh, these were groups of 10 to 15 students who would meet regularly once or twice a week. And also uh, because of peer mentoring, which was a big piece of what a lot of ESI schools were doing, where 11th and 12th graders were mentor, would mentor 9th and 10th grade boys. Finally, in the college and career culture um, domain, most, a majority of the schools were improving or expanding on college programming. Um, but beyond the program, we also heard a real shift from um, focusing on high school graduation, as uh, Sean mentioned earlier, to focusing on college, to explicitly focusing on college. Secondly, teachers and administrators um, also talked about communicating the steps to get to college to ninth grade students very early on in the, their high school career, noting that by the time they got to junior year, sometimes it was too late to make up course credit or make up regents um, to actually get into college and thrive there. And finally, while a majority of these schools were already providing a lot of college supports to 11th and 12th grade students, um, because of ESI, they reported now providing those same college supports, college trips, college workshops, to particularly to the ninth grade students and this year to 10th grade students. Uh, as a part of ESI, schools had ample opportunities to participate in training around culturally relevant education. Um, according to Gloria Latson Billings, uh, culture relevant education is, quote, a framework that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural references in all aspects of learning. Um, and as a result of some of this training, the schools that participated really reported both a change in teacher mindsets and beliefs around instruction and, uh, and uh, about their students, and also a change in practice. Um, so first, teachers talked about having a deeper awareness about the unique and specific challenges facing black and Latino young men, um, uh, including the structural inequalities that Pedro mentioned before, the inequalities that they might face outside of the school building, and also some of the biases that they might face even from their own teachers within their buildings. Um, and also, in, a, in response to the CRE training, some schools were adopting or adapting new practices um, such as the single-sex advisory classes that I had mentioned earlier, um, and also just providing students a lot of opportunity to talk through issues that were relevant to their, uh, to their lives, things like stop and frisk, or in one school um, that I remember uh, just the experience of being black and Latino in their school with a predominantly white staff. So these were some of the opportunities that they got to talk about in their schools. And finally, as you see, the, the image there, um, trying to bring all of these pieces together, not only the three domains, but also the culturally relevant piece, um, schools reported that cohesion was really important, really integrating all of these different pieces so that they work together and not just as different silos. Um, I should say this, the level of cohesion really ranged from school to school. Some schools really treated ESI as an add-on program. Other schools had really done a lot to infuse ESI into their culture and mission of the school. Um, and the ways that they did that were uh, some of the things that you see here, creating connections between different ESI programs, even if they had five or six different programs, really trying to understand what, br what brought them together, um, creating connections between ESI and other existing programs that had already existed in their school, um, and building it into the school day, for example. And finally, involving multiple staff 
So not just the principal and the ESI design team leader, not just one or two people in the building, but really several people in the building so that the ESI could live on be beyond the length of the initiative and be beyond any um, potential staff turnover. Just two more minutes, okay, um, or one more. Um, so quick summary, ESI, we found by visiting these schools that it's being implemented largely as it was intended. Schools are creating and expanding programs around these three domain areas and also around CRE, culture relevant education. And program cohesion really emerged as something that might be important for sustainability. So we're really gonna look more closely at that in the next few years. Um, our evaluation will continue to look at implementation, but now we're also going to be looking at um, impact and whether uh, ESI has impacted students' academic outcomes, but also their non-academic outcomes that you mentioned before, the resilience, persistence, some of these outcomes that we know uh, may have an uh, impact on college readiness. And finally, how these impacts might be connected to different levels of implementation across the 40 schools. So that was a very quick and um, abbreviated overview of the, of the findings. If you would like the full report, it's being released in the next few weeks um, on the website here. And then also, um, if you would like to receive it in email and any other updates about our work, you can sign up at the bottom as well. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Um, Michael, you've actually been doing this. Um, and so you are actually, in some ways, our most important speaker because you've been on the ground. So give us a, a ground eye view. Sure. So good evening, everyone. So I have a PowerPoint. I'm hoping that I can just show you a few things that I've been doing at my school. Um, and I'm very excited to have been selected to uh, enter the ESI family. I first like to say uh, thank you to um, CUNY Institute for Education Policy for hosting this event and my fellow panelists. Thank you. So this is give you some brief, brief uh, background information about my student population. We have 518 students um, of males, 314, 220 are black males, 79 are Latino, and other males are 16. So the question was, what has been difficult about integrating ESI into the school culture? Um, as you know, ESI has three tenets, academics, youth development, and school culture. Um, as you see, there's several items that are listed that has been a challenge. But one that stands out to me, the, well, there's a few of them that stands out to me the most. Um, and I would say for academics is, is habits of mind. There's something that we, we speak about all the time, principals and myself, about the productive struggle. Um, and that's something that's just challenging. And it doesn't matter the amount of money kids have to put forth effort. And that's something that we're working on each and every day um, in terms of the productive struggle. For example, um, if students who are in physics, you know, even with their innate ability, if they don't put forth effort, they're not gonna do well. However, there's other students who we want to get to physics and they don't want to go to physics because they know the math is challenging, right? So we have to help them with strategies. We have to give them resources and show them how it's possible to get to physics and get through physics and take trigonometry in the 10th grade. Um, so productive struggle is something that principals, myself and others, my whole school community are always talking about. Um, so that's one of the challenges. For youth development, again, you see a lot of them listed. Um, but I would say, for me, it's um, restorative justice, which we have in my school. And I, not the fact that kids have um, infractions and they, they have um, situations that they have to be held accountable for, but more importantly, why, why they have those infractions and what happens in a youth court. And for those of you who do not know, Youth Court is a, is a, um, a program at my school and across the city where students are uh, judging each other in terms of peers um, for a Youth Court program. Um, and basically what happens in this, this program is when they're sitting in the Youth Court and they open up, there's a lot of things that students express. Um, they could say that, you know, I'm living in a shelter, I'm upset, they could say that you know, Mr. Prayer, I'm, you know, you, you don't know that my lights would turn out and I had to do my, my homework, 
with no lights. I'm, I'm looking, I'm using the moonlight to actually do my homework. There's a lot of stories our kids open up. They don't, they don't tell us immediately. We have to find these things out. But basically, when they open up, one of the challenges is really making sure that I can give them more support, more mentoring. Because when they open up, we just don't want them to open up and leave them there. We want to help them, right? So there's a lot of challenges with that. Um, and these things happen daily. For school culture, I would say, again, self-efficacy among our black and Latino males is an ongoing problem. Um, and it's not that, you know, our kids come in. There's, there's, we're going to have honest kids, honest kids that come in, and they have the effort. Then you're going to have another group that feel like, you know, if they don't want to do their homework or they do, do not want to um, persist with trigonometry in the 10th grade. And the question is why? Why do they feel like this? Why do they run away? And it's really because of failure, right? They, they're afraid, afraid of failure. So we try to take that away. We try to give them the skills and strategies to persist through failure. So again, these are some of the, the items that I listed um, daily. Um, and this is happening daily. I have a few others, but I won't go into it for the sake of time. Um, then I was asked what has been encouraging about ESI so far. And as you see, there's a lot that I have listed um, because it's really made a huge difference in my school community, my school culture. Um, I won't read them, but I, I have a few slides I'd like to show you. So I know Pedro spoke about the community external factors. Um, and it, that is a major problem, but I'm happy that with my school community and, and ex I have this program called ECOS Family, and that is external contributors of success. And basically, you see a list of uh, contributors to my school who's really been helping me out, um, really helping me out, really making my, really becoming a part of my school community. Um, so we have Mega Everest College, Brooklyn College, the Learning Guide. I have a few, a, a lot of things listed here. Um, Adelaide Sanford Institute. But I'm really thinking post ESI. I'm thinking post the grant because I have to, because I want to make sure I can sustain my success. Um, but this is just uh, some contributors who really help me out daily. So again, one of the things that we do every year since we've um, had the grant, we have a summer um, bridge program focusing on STEM and a bridge to college course. And basically, our incoming ninth grade scholars are exposed to our school unique and enriching learning environment. They learn how to support each other as they transition from middle to high school and explore college and career through a series of activities and opportunities. Um, at the bottom, you'll see we have something called failure and difficulties are only feedback. And again, this is an ESI strategy, something that our kids are used to now. So they don't run away from failure. They understand that it's feedback and it's an opportunity for them to grow. And that's something that we have to keep reminding them each and every day. And I'm just going to show you a few of our teachers and participants of our, our summer bridge program. We also have summer bridge for the robotics. Our incoming freshmen work collaboratively, collaboratively on robotics. And then they actually participate in this annual citywide robotics competition. And I also, just if I could, just show a clip. The Department of Education started an academic initiative in select schools across the city to help black and Latino students prepare for their future. Our Dana Arshin takes a look at a Brooklyn school where the students say they've already grown tremendously because of the program. Hundreds right, of students so here at Brooklyn Morning, High School for Law and Technology in Bushwick are getting a very number. special and unique education. I wasn't really an active student, but now I have all these activities and programs, so I have a better bond with my classmates and peers. Tenth grader Nicholas Harper attributes his academic success to the Department of Education's program ESI, which stands for Expanded Success Initiative. It's aimed to help black and Latino male high school students prepare for college and the real world. ESI has inspired so many programs here at the school, like this mock courtroom, and the job of judge belongs to tenth grader Marlon Spence. It really, like, lets me know like the law process and it helps me expand my vocabulary and it helps me public speaking. And this TV studio where the students conduct interviews and put together different news segments just like on News 12. Pretty much put my whole 
perspective into you like changing my whole career goal from being a lawyer into a computer science major or media, media industry major? ESI started two years ago in 40 schools citywide, most of them here in Brooklyn. Educators say they've already seen a huge impact. I'm happy and I'm really excited that they want to be here and want to be a part of our school community. Reporting from Bushwick, Dana Arshin, News 12, Brooklyn. So let me uh, ask a few questions, if I may, and um, I invite all the panelists to, to chime in, though the first one may be a little bit geared towards Pedro. Uh, there is a national debate, which you're very, very well aware. Um, I might put it this way, uh, Eva Moskowitz on one side, Richard Rothstein on the other. Um, one view that uh, you have the capacity to create a space that, in a sense, is quite remote from the background, from the rest of the world, that, that seals it off, and that creates this hyper-educating result. Um, and the other view that um, the high results are often due to siphoning off weaker students, that in the end these results don't last, in the end without the structural changes we won't get anywhere. Um, this seems to be almost a zero-sum debate and I, I just wonder whether there's a way past it because if we wait for structural equality, you know, we can fight for it and we should fight for it, um, it's, but it's not tomorrow morning. Um, is there a way is it the Jeffrey Canada way? Is there a path that says both and, not either or? Because we are spending an awful lot of political energy bashing each other on, on this sort of zero sum game. So, so I, I would say having um, visited um, the Success Academy schools, even Moskowitz schools, um, a couple times, they're very good schools. Um, so there's no question, I think, about the quality, and there's a lot that public schools could learn from them. But one of the things that we should all learn from them is they're spending more money per child than the public schools. And that if you want those results, guess what? It costs, right? <laughs> and, and that's the part of the conversation we don't talk about, right? That is, there's a reason why she gets paid so well and those schools are so well endowed, right? That conversation's not, we don't have an honest, candid conversation about these things. Um, so that's one part of the problem here. The other part is that if, if you know, I would say, those are mostly poor kids right. of color in that school. Very few of them are homeless. Very few of them are, from, are undocumented. Very few of them are from foster care. So even amongst high-need kids, there are gradients in need, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so what we want is schools. New York City, I was in, in the Bronx. The median income in the Bronx is under $15,000. Median income, in the South Bronx, that is, South Bronx. Right? So, so we, we're talking about a large number of children whose families, they're not even near the poverty line. <laughs> right. So they're well below the poverty line. So they're coming to school with a vast array of other needs. So what we need is a more comprehensive strategy. Now, not everybody can do what Jeffrey Cannon has done. Jeffrey's raised lots of money. So I'm interested, I'm a practical person, and I, I don't think we can just look to that as the one model, which is one of the reasons why it's a problem when people yeah. say that's the model. Right. Not everybody can raise that kind of money. Right. But we could and should find ways to knit together support systems between other institutions and CBOs to support schools so that schools can focus on academics mm -hmm. and, not, and not ignore hunger and not ignore lack of housing, not ignore health, mm -hmm. all the other things we know impact child. This says we're focused on child development. Hungry kids don't do well in school. Right. Anybody who tells me they don't want to have kids who are worried about eating regularly doesn't know kids in New York City, mm -hmm. right? So we need a more comprehensive strategy. Mm -hmm. We need one that, that, that um, has leadership at the high level, but also engages community at a, at a, at a bottom, a grassroots right. level, so that we can provide more support to children. Following up on that, the role of foundations, the role of philanthropy, where is it going to make the biggest difference? Well, I think that the role of philanthropy uh, has to make uh, a difference in the continuum of the uh, education uh, spectrum. And different foundations have different focuses. And so I think 
what we need to see is foundations talking to each other more. Uh, when we look at uh, black and Latino young men, uh, there is a pipeline of success. Some of the things that we are seeing now is an increased focus on grade level reading, right? But if all foundations run to grade level reading, what's going to be the focus afterwards, right? I think one of the most critical things that the philanthropic community can do is not shy away from the issue of race and gender uh, when we're looking at education reform. And even in progressive philanthropic communities, that is uh, certainly a, a challenge. I think also moving forward, what the uh, philanthropic community needs to really take a look at that we are looking at, and Pedro talked about how long we have been uh, addressing uh, the school reform issue. We cannot look at, in the philanthropic community, uh, a generational issue with a grant-making cycle mindset. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. We cannot say that in three years, this initiative is going to solve right. every problem. Over 100 years of right. systemic, systemic problems. Right. So, one of the things that philanthropy can do that the, say, government cannot, and we can be risk takers, uh, we can be laboratories for change. Uh, what we did with ESI was, uh, I think, it is a unique public-private mm -hmm. uh, uh, partnership, and philanthropy can push, push certain issues that uh, they believe in, for example, the partnership here in New York City, we were really adamant in the uh, partnership that school discipline, data around school suspensions had to be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so part of the negotiations, although the marriage was already uh, uh, happened when we were at the table, uh, that we had to say, you know, part of this deal is we need to look at school suspension right. data. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's real. what foundations can do. They can push that. They can uh, right. be risk takers there. Uh, Michael, if there was one thing that the outside world could bring to your school to help you do the work you do every day, what would that be? Uh, one thing, um, I would say access and opportunity for my students. Um, I think that is critical. Um, I think that our students right now are actually um, taking advantage of access and opportunity due to the ECOS family I, I created, but more is needed. Um, certainly um, internships, internships, um, more, um, uh, I would say definitely more um, programs for college. Certainly when you look at um, College Board is another one I think is needed for across the board. Um, so yeah, I, I just access an opportunity internships. Great, great. Um, as I just follow up, I'd like to encourage people to write questions on their cards. Uh, we won't have a huge amount of time for that, but I do want to get to uh, some of the audience questions. Um, let me pose just one more question from, from here. There is a large debate, again, um, these are all large debates, about the role of family and family culture. Um, and uh, one thinks of Orlando Patterson, Rituals in Blood, one thinks of other texts. Um, is, the, is what you're seeing on the ground responsive to those academic treatments, in other words, uh, is the behavior at home a major contributor to the issues that we're dealing with at school? And is it changing? Are you seeing changing patterns of parenting um, in these communities? So um, I, I would say that, you know, with this the big question, this idea that, you know, there's a culture of poverty that contributes to the cycle of poverty. And, um, you know, one of the critiques of that is that it, it completely overlooks economic status, right? That is that, you know, you know I'll give you one small example. Uh, William Julius Wilson points to data showing, the sociologist this is, uh, showing that African-American males, eight times more likely to not support children out of wedlock unless you control for whether or not they have a job, then it's equal. Wow, that's amazing, huh? <laughs> and that's important information. Right? Certainly is, right? that, that, so, so I would say what we have to be careful about, I mean, it's, 
uh, this is why I say a schools alone strategy is too limited, mm -hmm. right? That is that there are many families struggling to get by. Anybody who didn't read the series about the girl in the homeless shelter, mm -hmm. Dasani, gotcha. um, that came out, um, I think, around Christmas time, um, and understand the struggles families are going through. This, there are a third of the people right now in shelters in New York City work, have jobs, and are still in shelters because they can't afford a place to live. So there are many families right on the margins. Mm -hmm. and, and for those families, they're making tough choices all the time. Now, does that mean they don't sometimes contribute to their child's problems? Of course. I think they do. Right. But I think that if we don't address this again um, more thoughtfully than we've seen, um, what we're going to see, the, the tendency to blame the poor for being poor mm -hmm. is always there, because that's deep in our puritanical culture, right? And, and what we've got to get away to, you know, I, I'm on the board of a group called Year Up, right? Year Up, their whole mission is closing the opportunity and divide. And it's amazing to see the young people with just a GED, after six months of training, going to jobs making $50,000 a year, right? Talk about a transformation in a person's life when they're able to, to get those kinds of opportunities. That's what we need to focus on. How do we, we live in a rich city. We're not, we are not Newark, okay? We're New York City. Those hedge funds that are given to Eva Moskowitz, they need to spread it around a little more, <laughs> right? And, and make sure that other people have a chance, not for a handout, for jobs that can really lead to a change in circumstance. Thank you. Well, what I would add to that um, is that you know, I had an opportunity here in New York City to be part of the Beacon School movement. And Beacon Schools are, are based on the premise that it takes an entire community and there needs to be a holistic approach and that educators alone in the school building uh, are not enough. And it takes a whole family approach. And I think that that is a concept that needs to uh, be expanded to all schools that using the school building, partnering with community-based organizations, and opening up the school weekends, evenings, and having the school a place for parents that may need support, job training, uh, uh, support, because when Pedro provides a, uh, a data point that the median income in the South Bronx is 15,000, we can't blame parents for uh, issues and conditions that uh, their children are facing. They need these jobs. And so I think the key point is that this is a real systemic issue beyond education. And if we just talk about education in a vacuum, uh, I think we're going to be short. You know, we continue to shortchange ourselves. From the audience, uh, absolutely fair point that this particular initiative is in high schools that had some prior success, some really serious investment in some of these strategies, and it is accelerating that success in, in powerful ways. But a question really for you and what you were seeing, do you think that this can translate into schools that in a sense are starting right at the baseline? Mm -hmm. Um, or do we already have to have a certain progress? Mm -hmm. Wow, everyone's asking a question, good. Uh, we, we started to answer that question actually in our baseline report, which might be in your folder, I'm not sure, but it's definitely on our website, um, by comparing these 40 high schools to the other, other city schools. And yes, they, do, they did have to serve um, at least 70% of their population had to be black and Latino. Um, they also had to have 65% of their population uh, be quali qualified for free or reduced price lunch. Um, so in those ways, they are very similar to um, other city schools. They also have a very similar students in terms of um, special education, in terms of, and Sarah, my colleague here, can probably speak to this more, but um, and in terms of uh, overaged population. So in essence, they do serve a lot of the same students. In fact, two of the schools are dual language schools, so they also serve newcomer schools as well. I mean, I think we, we have a lot to see about whether this can be replicated in other schools, but I think that at least in terms of student demographics, it's, it's pretty promising. Great. Uh, a question that strikes rather close to, to this home, which is, are you getting the teachers that you need to really use these strategies effectively. When you hire a new teacher, are they prepared to do the work you need them to do? Uh, a single word will do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say no. And it's unfortunate because, you know, teachers today, 
even myself, I know I had no idea I had to be prepared for social media. Social media is a big deal right now for principals in all schools. And there are things that's happening over the weekend when we come to work on Monday, we're not prepared for. And so social media is big. Um, but um, I think that teachers, along with myself, my whole school community, we must continually um, uh, reflect on what we feel is most important for our school and for our students, and maybe make some adjustments and keep looking for professional development. Okay. A uh, question here about the extraordinary suspension rate. Uh, nearly half of all preschoolers who are suspended are African Americans. So that, that experience gets internalized very early. As you know, the mayor is putting a very major investment in preschool, pre-K. Uh, what would the advice be uh, to the mayor to make sure that that investment is well spent? Well, one of the things I would say in uh, ESI uh, is lifting this up, and Paul Forbes, the director, can talk about this as well. This whole issue of uh, CRE and, and, and culturally relevant uh, uh, education and training for teachers is paramount. Uh, and, and, and Pedro started the conversation earlier about fear. Uh, I think there's also a belief gap in how too many of our uh, teachers uh, believe and see our children. And so if there's not professional development, uh, culturally relevant uh, uh, training, and seeing uh, our young men and behavior that may be responded differently because of race, and that's not put on the table. Um, it won't work. It, it won't. Pedro? Yeah. yeah. Um, we, you know, because this suspension problem, it's bad in preschool and it gets worse as they get older, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we held a, a meeting as part of the Young Men's Initiative. I was on the advisory board and uh, with a couple principals of large high schools in the city with high suspension rates. And one principal offered a very candid response. He said, we suspend because we lack other tools. Okay. And he told a story. He described a student who had come to his school who had been, just been released from Rikers and on his own was registering to go back to school. So he thought, responsible young man, lots of efficacy, right? Except that no notification, nothing about him was provided. So he gets to school. Within the first three hours, he's had four fights and punched a teacher in the face. And then they find out that he's bipolar and not on medication. Right? When, when, I can't say enough. Our schools are, are being expected to solve problems that are not just academic. And without those tools, then you're leaving it to a principal to figure out, how do I deal with this child? So what does he do? He puts them on the street. Now that child is a problem to the community because he wants to keep them from being a child in the school, a problem in the school. So we've got to recognize that if you wanted to stop it in preschool or elementary or middle, you're going to need other tools, social workers, psychologists. We're going to need to provide the supports our children need in order to be, have a chance to be successful. Um, if I could press you just a little bit on pre crash to pre-K, um, because this major investment is coming, what would you like to see as really the emphasis there? Quality. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, listen, as I keep worry, I'm worried that in the rush to do this quickly, we're going to compromise quality. You know, I was, you know, I'm, I'm impressed the saying they got all the teachers already. I'm surprised to hear <laughs> that because um, where are they getting all these highly trained preschool teachers from? I don't even know where they're going to put them. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about you. There's one in the audience. Okay, you raised your hand. <laughs> so um, I'm just worried about it, that we can't afford to compromise quality. I, I, do, I still don't get it why they didn't try to do it, you know, do it gradually <laughs> and to do it well. Um, so that's my concern. Okay. Can you go to so pre-K? Pre-K? Uh, what, what, the children who come to your school, what are you seeing as the largest challenges? Is it, is it the learning habits? Is it that sense of failure? Is, what, what are the, if you were to put your finger on it? Um, for me, it's, it's so many things. It's, it's not, not just, just one. one. But habits of mind certainly is one. Um, you know, again, the productive struggle is definitely one for everyone. But it's, it's so many factors. Um, but I, I do believe in terms of suspensions, I think there is an answer for that. I think what we're doing well at my school for youth court and not suspending students is good. 
Um, and I think mentoring is, is another key component um, where if I can't afford mentors from externally, I certainly uh, inspire and motivate my teachers to do it for me and with me, uh, even myself. I sit with a group of 15 young men daily. Um, so I, I think there are answers that we have within our school. We just got to, you know, the quality of the school is really about the quality of the, the leader, the quality of the student, and the quality of the teacher. Um, and the quality of the building as well. So these things factored in, you can really do a lot with. And I, and I found that success for my school. And I would just also add the quality of partnerships. Yeah, and quality of partnerships as well. Many of the uh, ESI schools, the schools around the country that are employing uh, restorative justice uh, practices um, are partnering with community-based organizations that that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And they are in the school building and facilitating uh, that process to, uh, for an alternative to suspension. Yeah. Question here about the police. Um, are they involved in the ESI initiative? Um, what of their presence in the schools? What's the impact? Talk to us a little bit about, about that. Anyone? Do you, do you have police in, in the program? Uh, no. No, other than, actually I do actually, but only for internships. That's what they provide. So I would imagine that some of the uh, ESI schools, I'm looking at a DOE, uh, I'm looking at the folks, uh, Paul and Vonda, you know, I'm gonna throw you the mic and you can uh, answer on part of the DOE that uh, uh, in many of the New York City schools, there are actually police uh, in, in yeah. the schools, right? And so I would imagine that some of the ESI schools that uh, exists. And I would imagine that uh, from school to school, that type of relationship uh, varies. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that, uh, and there was an effort, and I don't know how far along we are, to provide school uh, safety officials uh, with advanced training and extended training uh, to uh, become more of the solution than the problem at the front door. There, yeah, there is a school that I visited that does have um, a partnership with the police academy, and I, on top of the internships and career development, but also uh, ESI is really designed to be a whole school building reform model, so it shouldn't just, it ideally it shouldn't just include teachers and principals, but also security staff and other members of the school community. And there's actually a follow-up question, which is what kind of training and support was involved in this project? Because that's mm -hmm. always a question for replication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really do wish I could give Paul the mic here. Um, uh, so school, ESI schools actually meet regularly. Principals meet uh, and the ESI design team leaders meet. The ESI team at DOE provides them um, lots of opportunities and schools can't take advantage of everything, but there are so many professional development, not only um, related to culturally relevant education, but also things like habits of mind or working with specific partners. Anytime there's an opportunity um, to take students to events outside of the school building, that's also a, a piece of, um, of what they provide schools and students. Good, okay. Um, I'm going to shortly ask someone from, you, from the New York City DOE to actually speak to the department's role. But first, there is a question about the new mayor and the new chancellor and whether the panelists feel that uh, as a whole, this is an encouraging set of, of signals and directions um, in the context of, this is the question, do we move from the kind of accountability driven focus on test results, focus on the data to the opposite extreme um, of sort of no accountability, no data, or can we take the best of what was done in the decade that's just passed and add on to it a sense of the aspects that you started to speak to, Pedro? Are you optimistic as if you think we can carry both of these streams together. Uh, the reason, and I'm going to add a little editorial here, there's a well-known book by Tayek and Cuban called Tinkering Towards Utopia, where they point out that the history of American education is to go from one, one extreme reform and then abandon it, go to the other, and the result is a kind of, in fact, a, a tiny bit of tinkering because we never actually move through to the completion of any particular reform. As you look at where we are, can we take the best of what we've done and add to it? Well, I, I would hope so. I mean, I, I think that some of the things that, I think many of the new schools, for example, created over the last 12 years are, are clearly better. 
than the schools that were there before. So there were things that happened under the last 12 years that, that were making progress. Um, I'm a little concerned so far that I haven't heard uh, the chancellor or the mayor lay out a vision for what they're going to do. Um, now, I do hear things that give me a reason to be encouraged and optimistic. Um, I, it was very telling. Um, at, at many of you are familiar with this uh, scandal at the school in Far Rockaway, the school mm -hmm. of no, right, or the principal of no, and, 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 um, and the, the ways in which kids would be denied basic learning opportunities. And the chancellor sent a representative out there, and they asked her what she thought. She said, the school has problems, but it also has assets. Mm -hmm. And that was a very telling comment, right? Mm -hmm. Because what you want to do is build on assets, not just condemn a school, which is what we saw over the last 12 years. Mayor Bloomberg shut down 150 or so schools in New York City. They didn't have a plan for helping schools. I hope that this administration will have a plan for building capacity in schools and, even more importantly, giving schools a chance to learn from each other, including the charter schools. We frame this as a competition among schools when we should be collaborating and sharing to do this work better than we do now. So let's hope, I hope the mayor is listening out there. <laughs> do something good. <laughs> Maybe she's, this chancellor is watching. Um, <laughs> last question from the audience. Uh, and this sort of goes to the foundation of everything we've been saying. If, Pedro, you're right that without the fundamental structural reforms, um, things look pretty bleak, what do we say to the thousands of teachers and principals who each day are trying to make a difference for these students? After all, it's not just the students. Right? It's the teachers who are giving their lives to this work. And when they hear you, um, they could be forgiven, could they not, for saying, you know, am I not really making a difference? Um, because if we wait until that $15,000 income becomes a $40,000 income, my kids will be lost. So. You know, I, I am a pragmatic optimist, okay? Um, <laughs> Back. I feel about the public schools the way I do about the Knicks, although I'm losing my <laughs> faith in the Knicks quickly. I don't uh, know about that, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would say this. There, I can name schools in New York City that are making a difference right now because they're led by people like you who are resourceful, visionary, who are figuring out how to make a difference for their kids. Those schools exist in New York City. So that gives me reason for some optimism. What, what, what worries me is that we're not learning from those schools, and we're not doing the things to make it possible to create more of them. I was at a meeting about a month ago in the South Bronx that, that had together all of the nonprofits. It was featured at hostels, it, educators. It gave me a reason that maybe if this is happening in more places, we can start to build the systems of support that schools, children, and family need. Yeah. I'm hopeful that, that more of that will happen in New York. And, and I think, you know, on top of that, you know, how do you quantify hope, right? And the question, the answer to your question is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's how you quantify. Um, no, you can't be forgiven for, if you're a teacher, uh, for giving up hope, right? And once the, mo the moment you give up hope on our children, it's time to find another profession. So there are across this city, across this country, success stories, what's working, and how do we promote and spread what's working? ESI, in fact, is a laboratory of best practices. The vision for these 40 schools and what worries me about the change in administration and whether or not uh, we can see this for the long haul is, how do we take what we're learning in these 40 schools for black and Latino boys uh, around school culture, youth development, academic rigor, and spread it system-wide? Uh, and, and so, yes, it's hard work. Uh, yes, there can be a tendency uh, to have a little uh, despair. But uh, make sure that that's gone before you leave your house in the morning and you're in front of your class uh, of, of, of students. Uh, Find another business if you are not hopeful about teaching young people. You've seen these teachers. Mm -hmm. Are they hopeful? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm always impressed going into a school about how hard people are working and how much they care and how passionate they are. And I, not to say that caring is the only thing and relationships isn't the only thing that matters in a school and certainly to college readiness and which ESI is really designed to, to, to improve. But, um, but, but without it, um, I don't think any change can be made. So the fact that they are uh, prioritizing the relationships and really giving it their all, whether it's through ESI or another initiative or just regular everyday school programming, um, that always gives me a lot of hope. And talk to us about the morale of the teachers in your school. So the teachers in my school are certainly inspired and motivated. Uh, ESI has contributed to that inspiration. Um, they have access to professional development that they would not probably have had. Um, um, they get to bond with students outside of the classroom, which is huge. So relationships is big for my teachers and the students. And so that's creating a culture that we have. Uh, you walk in my building, you automatically feel the culture. You feel love. And you know that teachers are teaching through a lens of understanding, not through a lens of sh being short-sighted. You know, I can personally attest uh, to that. I visited his school. And from the moment you walk, you know, you could tell the school culture the moment you walk through the door. And from the security uh, 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 person there, it was an infirming, powerful uh, school culture in the, the day that I spent there. Uh, so I, I can attest firsthand. Well, at the schools of education, we have obviously a lot to learn uh, to help mm. to create. And, and Deborah Shanley is here, the Dean of the School of Education of Brooklyn, to create the kind of, of listening environment where we're not talking past each other. And then working with teachers beyond their graduation. So we have a part to play here as well. Um, and it's also our responsibility. So no, no outs uh, and nothing easy, clearly, on the basis of, of this evening's conversation, everything we know about the situation. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank the audience. This is the beginning of a conversation. We will be revisiting this theme constantly at this institute because, again, one can't think of anything more important um, we will be open to working, and now, as a closing remark, I want to invite uh, a representative from New York City DOE. We've been talking a lot about the department. It is only fair that Vanda gets a chance to say a few words uh, from the department. Thank you everyone for uh, inviting us here this evening. My name is Vonda Belusig-Voller and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Post-Secondary Readiness at the New York City Department of Education. Um, first, I'd like to thank David Steiner and his team for opening up this engaging and important dialogue. Uh, I am completely humbled and honored that the work of our schools is part of a conversation with leaders like Pedro Naguada and Sean Dove, and to Michael Pryor, who represents the best of our principals, I thank you deeply. Um, and Adriana continues to push us and teach us and remind us of the things the work is far from done. Tonight's dialogue is both enlightening and sobering for me. It provides some concrete reference points for ways to reverse negative stereotypes that have plagued our black and Latino boys for way too many decades. As many of you know, listening here tonight, um, the challenges are deep. You've heard these numbers before. In 2012, only 17% of our black boys and 22% of our Latino young males graduated with a New York City high school diploma that meant they were college and career ready as defined by New York State. Those numbers mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but let me tell you what they mean to me. It means that far too many young people wake up on far too many mornings and do exactly what we tell them. They get up, they make their way to school despite the challenges around them. They attend class, they go to class, they study hard, they do what we tell them. And in essence, they think, we, in an essence, we've sold them a bill of goods. They work hard, and they work harder to reach benchmarks that mean that they have a high school diploma. And still, they are at risk for dreams deferred. And that's simply unacceptable to me. What this signals for us in New York City and as a district is that, um, to paraphrase Jeff Canada, I do it all the time. I do Pedro or two, but maybe I won't do that tonight. Um, <laughs> if we want dramatically different outcomes, we need to start doing things dramatically different. So, we decided with ESI, things could not be business as usual. We had to push ourselves, our partners, and our schools towards new solutions because business as usual is not working. 
The intricacies of these school challenges are compounded and exasperated by societal inequities related to ra race and economic class. And for the inception of the Expanded Success Initiative, we knew that our solution for changing the statistics would mean that we could not be unwitting participants in the hopeless deficit narrative that has been undermining the talents of these students for decades. So we decided we were gonna change that narrative first by taking an anti-deficit approach. And you heard Sean Hopper's name. If you have not read his ESI report, um, you should. Um, we knew that to change the narrative, we had to think about communities in sustainable ways, and it was our responsibility to start with schools at the focus of change. Super excited to hear folks talk about schools learning from each other, from growing with each other, because from our inception of ESI, we invited schools to a design challenge. They were indeed schools who, by I don't know what standards, we call them doing better. Um, and by that, they had the same populations that Michael School represents. However, they were already graduating black and Latino boys with more high school diplomas than their counterparts. We did that purposefully because this initiative is about college and career readiness. A high school diploma is not good enough for any any kid in this city. Um, we invited them to work together, to think together, to work with each other, to learn from experts, and to design a plan where it could be a sustainable plan, plan in a school community. What was important to us was that this initiative did not end when the uh, generosity of Open Society Foundations disappeared. And so we believe and still believe that the closest to those closest to the students can help impact and change their lives. And we knew that they would be the ones who would help us find solutions that would change the lives of our black Latino boys, our girls, and could influence the country. Michael Pryor and his work in his school is testament to that. We knew we needed to invest in schools, provide them with different resources, find multiple avenues for support, and allow them the flexibility to experiment, to think about how to refine programmatic structures, and in essence, to fail up to understand that a good idea is not worth throwing away just because it didn't work the first time. This is why the Expanded Succession Initiative is not and was never intended to be just an arbitrary selection of practices that Central bestowed on schools. We purposely built this initiative as a development laboratory so that our schools could discover and create different ways of teaching and learning with the purpose of uncovering and develop innovative ways of educating and reaching young people. Since then, since then, our schools have ramped up mentoring programs, summer bridge programs, math and English instruction through a culturally responsive lens. These are just a few of the great things going on across the schools. There's also new schools we're opening. We're making sure that those schools understand the intricacies and the interdependencies of academics, youth development, school culture, and the power of partners. These new schools are intentionally built with students in mind. And here's where I think about, or he probably would never know this because I don't think we've ever met. I was a principal for Dr. Marsha Lyles in Red Hook, and you spoke. And something that has really pushed us, and my fellows are laughing because they know I say it to them all the time. Um, what you said was that we spend millions of dollars on reform, but we never talk to kids. And so our ESI fellows run a student fellowship. And our new schools are being driven not just by the brilliant ideas of the adults in the building who need to hear how smart they are, I'm one of them, um, but also from students in the 40 schools helping us understand how school can and should look different. Um, Tonight's dialogue is a step in surfacing the ideas and practices that can and will be replicated through our system. But we're not done. It's just a small step in a journey driven by continued innovation, ongoing research, continued iterations of good ideas. I'm grateful for the work of the Research Alliance and the team. They provide us with the, uh, what enhances and sometimes challenges our work. Um, our own ESI team, Paul said it to me the other day, that we continue to learn from our ESI schools and the research, and as a result, the work gets stronger. The work of the ESI 40 informs not only our perspective, but also our fellows. Um, personally, I am so thrilled and humbled to be at the helm of this work with an amazing team because the thought of a single dream deferred, another young life whose, density is, uh, whose destiny is halted because of gaps in our system is merely unacceptable. Every student, no matter background, can be successful when given the right balance of resource and attention. The trick for us is finding that right balance within a complex system. But it is our moral imperative to give students, especially those for whom education is a transformative investment to lift themselves up into productive citizens. Our collective success should be celebrated tonight. 
but also never forget that every victory has meaning only in the context of developing the capacity across this city. And our educators understand that and will work with us to get there. This is, well, you know our theory of action. We're building a model of schools where cultural relevance is intentional, as intentional as academic rigor, internships, mentoring, youth development, and culture. It is not an add-on. It is inherent and central. That's our part in trying to achieve excellence through equity. For now, I'll just say I want to thank our schools who uh, share their experiences with us and continue to, they are lab rats for us and I can't thank them enough. Um, and the Research Alliance who continue to remind us of where we need to focus. Our school's voice is so important and I want them to know that we are listening. Um, I also want to thank my own team whose ideas, commitment, and renewed effort to this is, is just incredible. Thank you to everyone here tonight and who's watching this live cast event. I'm grateful that you are listening and as hungry as I am for answers. We are in this dialogue together and it should not end tonight. We still have a long way to go, but through the expanded success initiative and with support with, from folks like the Open Society Foundation, with perspective uh, of scholars like Pedro Negueta, our critical eyes from Research Alliance, our school leaders, and our team, the relentless work of culturally responsive schools like the ones participating in ESI, I believe we are collectively building a roadmap that brings us closer to changing history and stemming the tide of dreams deferred one student at a time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all.